He's trying to run away. The event arrives and it's not working. Primordial Boost does not have enough damage. It is Fnatic that has earned the right to defend their title in Rotterdam. Barely getting himself out alive. Licorice is the next target. TSM, three for zero. Make it four. They made the reverse sweep happen. And TSM will earn their place in St. Louis. Three teams left in EU, two teams left in North America, and the finals of the spring split are just around the corner. I'm Lisa Duan, and this is Matt Hempstead, and today on Esports in 30, we're getting you caught up on all the League of Legends action. All right, Matt, a lot went down this weekend, yes. so why don't you give us a little sneak peek of what we're going to be breaking down today? I'll try to give a little bit without little bit. totally exposing what went happened. Um, in EU, we saw the best teams really dominate and shown that, you know, they deserve to be in the finals and that there's a reason why they finished first in the regular season. Over in North America, uh, game five, reverse sweeps, lots of drama until the second best of five went completely in uh, another way, uh, which was a complete sweep minus the reverse sweep. So, you know, lots of sweeping in NA. Sweeps. Um, also some sweeping in EU, lots of brooming. So uh <laughs> I don't know if that's even a word, but anyways, I hope no one was brooming on the weekend, just watch the league instead. <laughs> You know? I, just heard, I just heard a lot of sweep, sweep, sweep. All yes. right, so we've got a special guest to help us break down North America. But before we get to that, let's check out these highlights from the NA semifinals. Baron's going to be taken down. Cloud9 having already secured the objective will now look for the fight. They'll find Pearson. They'll find Smoothie. They'll find Spin. And Cloud9 will look to find the win right here. Fade is down. Oh. It's a broken blade going into the back lines of Cloud9, looking to find the CC, not going to get a whole lot just yet. Smoothie's going to be taken down by Nisky. Tinskara now finding the damage. Fifth going to be executed. Tinskara takes them down. Acadian cut down next. And that is four kills, Cloud9. TSM will try to hold, but there is no way they can 3v5 this here. Cloud9 has made their way over the Nexus, and they have made their way to match point. Ultimate keeps them alive for now. Hello. A lot of damage on Cloud9. Janitor, baby! Mop and bucket at the ready! It's pure to no cleanup duty! Sinskara's gonna be taken low! Sneaky's gonna be taken down! Zazel drops next! Sinskara with the flash away! But Bjergsen is spinning that come all the way around! Goes to the resurrection! Sinskara looking to grab the kill on his fence! Bjergsen already gonna be grabbing the kill on now to Zazel as well! Misky taken very low! Bjergsen's gonna be taken into the stasis! TSM will collapse and destroy Cloud9! Arcadian going behind enemy line, looking to grab the kill onto Sneaky. Taunt's gonna be used, but not even needed. The health bars evaporate. Cloud9 evaporates. And TSM, in 25 quick minutes, will take us to game number five. And that is why they have these pinks in the area, but they're looking for Nisky. Wow, Nisky is gonna be the target and shut down instantly by the side of TSM. Acadian grabs the kill credit on that one, and Licorice will be number two. Here comes the Ornhorn. Licorice not able to deliver on that one. Zazel coming in from behind. Acadian's gonna be taken low, nearly taken down. Spin scare on the first death here of this fight. Zazel still looking at front line on this one. Broken Blade's able to find Hemo Blake on the two. Sneaky's gonna be yeah. very low, barely getting himself out alive. Licorice is the next target. TSM, it started rough. They made the reverse sweep happen, and TSM will earn their place in St. Louis. for Team Blade, but they're chasing down Turtle 2. He's going to get crescendo. They're going to have a follow through as Dublin takes him down. Now and now watch out. Impact, going to land some damage, and there is first blood. Got to run away from this one. There's a quick drowsy bubble gun away, but there is the pull. They found Ezreal, and maybe you got to pay your tax. It's April after all. I also like how you can even see on... Ooh, that could be enough. The flash is too late. It's going to burn, and that's first blood. 1v1 in the mid lane. For Jensen. Yeah, have a cannon mini here trying to push on this. Oh, and Hibbert. Whoa! Oh, Jensen. This goes to Team Liquid. This must be the death knell that closed it out. Oh, oh my God. Team Liquid back on form for their date with TSM. A team they beat before. A Nexus they will smash. Looking for title number three. Pat the KDA. Close the series down. Team Liquid 3 0 in the finals. The LCS final is set in stone. It'll be TSM versus Team Liquid for the spring split title. To recap the semifinals, we got Daniel Digon Gonzalez joining us. How's it going? 
Great. That was, that was perfect, Lisa. I appreciate it. How's it going, guys? <laughs> so yeah, awesome to have you here because we have to break down, first of all, this epic best of five between TSM and Cloud9. So spoiler alert, guys, TSM pulled off the reverse <laughs> sweep and earned their spot in the finals. So from your perspective, how did TSM bounce back from the first two games to win the next three? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, based on their experience of their MVP candidate, mid laner Bjergsen. Um, you can't say enough about the guy. He's done it time in and time out. And I think when you have a player like this and someone like Sven as well in the bot lane, you've got a ton of experience regardless of what the odds were. And I think finally, once TSM started shifting their strategy around uh, making Broken Blade comfortable and putting Bjergsen on playmakers, uh, that changed the whole game around. I mean, right out of the gate, it looked like TSM was pretty nervous. At least some of their younger players, like Acadian and Broken Blade, whose only playoff experience in North America was against Echo Fox in the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, going into you know this round, those first two games against Cloud9, huge stage, big deal. And for Bjergsen, they finally in game three put him on something that he's able to you know roam around a bit more on. The mm -hmm. Akali was a huge performance. Mm -hmm. So do you think that you know putting Bjergsen on someone a bit more uh, playmaking with more roaming ability was part of the, the changing in uh, games two to game three to five? Yeah, I think it's twofold. I think it is that you, you get Bjergsen, your best player on a playmaker, but it's also what Cloud9 did to the mid lane matchup. In the first several matches, they put Niski on something to mitigate Bjergsen's ability. And what I mean is something that just shoves in the wave and something that forces Bjergsen to stay in lane so he can't help out in other skirmishes. He can't go gank and, and use his great ability into other lanes to get those guys going. And then in, in games three and four, they put Niski on playmaker. They try to use Zed. They used a zillion to try and get crafty, but that was when uh, Bjergsen was on Akali. And so then once it's game five, now all the momentum has been sucked out of Cloud9 and onto TSM's side. So I think it's a bit of both things there, but y you saw a difference between a team that was playing not to lose top lane to all of a sudden trying to win through the mid lane. Hmm. Mm, wait, so do you think that was the first mistake that Cloud9 made, just like switching up the draft and giving Bjergsen that place to roam, like to actually make more plays and stuff? Like that was their first mistake? Yeah, and, and I would say even in these games, it really didn't matter what side you were on in terms of draft, in terms of picking, because mm -hmm. I think it came down to execution. But through the draft, now you're giving a team who has a superstar, probably the best player in the Ooh. NALCS, uh, more tools. He had more tools to work with. And so anytime you do that, that, that's pretty difficult. So it's really hard to ever go against Reaper in terms of his draft, because they did come up with the uh, Tarek Sono bot lane. <laughs> However, that's kind of where I would point to. There was one big thing in the draft that kind of stood out, especially in game five. I know Reaper got a lot of criticism for picking Orn into the Braum because, you know, they needed some sort of engage, but the Orn is basically completely countered by Braum in this matchup. So do you think that was part of the downfall in game five or was there more to it than just that one pick? Yeah, that, that was a head scratcher. You know, you could have yeah. gone Scion. If you really wanted to engage, you could have gone Malphite and put Licorice on something else. But uh, there in, in, in scrims, there's definitely that uh, rock, paper, scissors of, OK, let's use something that isn't the Orn ultimate to get Braum to put down his unbreakable shield, and then we can use Orn ultimate. And it's just, it's a window. And so you're gambling that Smoothie's gonna open up those windows. He's not gonna have the discipline to not use the shield before Orn is put down. And it's something that people gamble into all the time. So I would say yes, but I see where Reaper's coming from and you, you can opt into that. But uh, yeah, there, there could have been something else there. In this series, you know, a lot of eyes were on Bjergsen, but let's talk about top lane too, because yeah. Broken Blade, everyone was wondering how he would perform. How did you think he did? I thought I thought Broken Blade played well. You know, in the first game, he was 3-0-0 on Akali when they gave him the carry. I think it was more about uh, a tale of two swole bros. You had <laughs> Akkadian uh, go into never played in playoff before Akkadian mode in games one and two. And then in games three through five, just completely different player, even on the same champion. He played Gragas back to back. And I think that enabled Broken Blade to show off what he could do. Um, and one of the reasons why they made that switch to, uh, from him to uh, uh, Hanser now on TSM. So I think it's it, it was it was just a synergetic thing. It went all around. I mean, you talked about Akkadian there for a little bit, and uh, I mean, in game one and two, Svenskeren absolutely dominated, and it looked like he would just keep st uh, steamrolling over Akkadian going into game three. But all of a sudden, it just kind of, they flipped the switch, and Akkadian mm -hmm. really bounced back really well. How does a player go from, you know, being one of the reasons why the team is losing to all of a sudden just showing up in game three? Is it just really as simple as, you know, nothing left to lose, which is what some of the TS uh, TSM members were saying? 
Yeah, I, I really do believe that. And I, you think about Acadian's career. He spent time over at Echo Fox, obviously in Optic, and now at TSM. And he wasn't even supposed to be the start here. It was supposed to be Grig once again. And I think when you... When your back is against the wall and you don't have anything left to lose, you think about your journey that's been there. And Matt is very, very good at being able to reset after after uh, a couple of downfalls. And he knew, hey, this is on me. I'm not able to unlock my mid laner to get him to roam. And that's what I loved about his performance uh, yesterday or two days ago, because of the fact that he played the same champion over and over again. He, he got to play Gragas, and he got to see what a brag bad Gragas looked like, and he got to see what a good Gragas looked like. And that is a hallmark mark of a championship type of jungler. Now, speaking of jungle, we have to mention just this champion, Jarvan. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> is there just a curse on Jarvan? Why <laughs> is Jarvan not performing that well in, I guess, NA? Yeah, I, when you when you play Jarvan, it's it's very obvious when you miss. If you go in <laughs> with your true. flag and drag combo and miss everybody, that's bad. It's and bad. I think it's good when it works, right? It's mm -hmm. good when it works. That's why you keep coming back to it. When you when you work in scrims, you have your priority list of what's you know what's top tier, what's next tier, what's after that, and you have to follow it. And I think J4 and Cloud9 have been synonymous back at the contract days. Like that's where Contracts made his name in Worlds 2017. And I think here's an opportunity uh, to get Svenskeren, who's now lost a couple games in a row, on something that he can at least facilitate with, facilitate the ganks use your laners abilities you have licorice you have one of the best bot lanes uh, in na and he just wasn't quite able to get it over and over again compared to the kindred that was running around the gragas that was using displacement mm -hmm. and it's so easy to look at that and be like oh look at the stats that pick's not great <laughs> but in scrims if that's what's been working for you because of how it's supposed to work which is get your other laners going then you keep coming back to it unfortunately it didn't pan out for cloud nine yeah, Thanks. Jarvan didn't look so hot, but True. something that's kind of new. I mean, we've seen it in Academy a little bit, but mm -hmm. obviously we need to talk about this, the Sona Tarek Bali that kind of <laughs> came out of nowhere. I mean, um, you know, Cloud9 brought it out first and it looked pretty damn strong. So what is it exactly that makes this lane so tough to beat? Because, I mean, they just seem like they can sustain through basically anything. Yeah, I, that's, that's basically it. You know, every patch, there's always something that can can slide through that the the uh, balance team doesn't really realize. I think for a while it was Ardent Sensor was broken all of t uh, 2017 yeah. season seven, uh, and no one noticed. No one knew. No one was ever building it, and there were no patches for it that updated it. It was the same thing from MSI on to the end of Worlds, but everyone had to build it. I think it's the same thing here. Uh, Sona and Tarek, with their healing, they're able to take upfront burst because Sona has the power cord with her auto attack. She is ranged uh, because any other healing healing combo, you don't really have a ranged combo to dish out damage, but you're able to build Lich Bane, you're able to uh, facilitate that with auto attacks, and I think that makes it such a sustainable uh, lane, and unless you have kill potential, unless you're playing like uh, Blitzcrank and you're hooking someone under the turret with Ignite and a gank coming, uh, that lane is so, so safe just with the healing, with the passive armor that comes from Tarek, so I think that's something that teams will look to continue to exploit if it's not Patch fix, uh, or, bug or fix. banned, yeah. <laughs> or banned, the yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's funny because actually do I will dominate. I know you're friends with him. He actually tweeted out saying players have to choose between playing Sonic. Oh, Sonic. See, I just I just put <laughs> yeah. their names together. Sona <laughs> and Tarek, bot lane or touching a woman. It's like it's so dirty. It's pretty grimy. That, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna become a dirty Sona player. There you go. Confirmed. <laughs> All right, let's hone in on that Team Liquid and FlyQuest matchup now. So it wasn't very close as Team Liquid no. walked away with a 3-0 sweep. So do you think TL is now back to like their early split form where they're looking very strong? Yeah, and I, I would say that yeah. I think when you are reaching the heights that Team Liquid were throughout the season, it gives you leeway to experiment a little bit, which is why you have that recency bias of Team Liquid being on a downslope and possibly looking vulnerable. I think they were just experimenting and trying different things. And uh, and so they it ended up with not the perfect record and a couple of losses at the end of the season. And to be honest, I bought into that. I thought FlyQuest was a good matchup for Team Liquid. You go ahead and play through Viper through the top lane and try to exploit impact, which Time and time again, team tries to do because you can't do it through Jensen, you can't do it through double lift. X Smith is such a smart jungler. So let's work through a former world champion impact. And that didn't quite pan out for FlyQuest either. And I think after that first game, everything fell apart. 
uh, and it, it, it's tough because it was such a heartbreaker because FlyQuest was in it for such a long time, uh, and and they were stalling out, stalling out, trying to outscale this Sonoteric bot lane in game one. Fortunately, they weren't able to, and you could just see the faces. I think I saw Turtle's face after game one. The, the cameras panned to him, and he looked he looked more sad than usual. Turtle usually is like, ah, I hate losing, but this one looked like, dang, yeah. I just lost to Sonoteric. <laughs> Bad, and man. even on that, every time they went to Pobelter's cam, it looked like he had that nervous laugh, like, oh, oh no, oh, we're, no. we're getting stomped. This is it. Um, but I mean, one thing Double Lift said after they beat FlyQuest was that they've been performing like terribly in scrims, absolutely horribly. I think he said like they had a 20% win rate possibly, which is not, not, not good, good in scrims. And they had to do some deep diving into how to get back to their old Team Liquid days. So how do you think, uh, like, is this a concern going into the finals or are they now just okay, they shook it off on, the, on stage against FlyQuest and they're good to roll forward? I think when you go into a slump like that and you don't have a game, so say they had that bye week last week, then there's some concern, but the fact that they were able to show up and show up dominantly against this FlyQuest team, that was an upstart that seemed to be like a fan favorite here. Um, I think that gets away all the jitters that you would have in terms of bad scrim results, because the whole the whole adage is like, okay, scrim results don't really matter. We might win or whatever in scrim results. You know who talks about scrim results? People that take scrims uh, for for uh, record based, right? If you're going around saying, oh, we have the 55% win record in uh, scrims, well, that's because you care about that. You're not caring as much about what you're learning about, what you're trying. Did this pick work? Did this early invade work? You know, how did it break the game? Those are things that you should care about when you're scrimming. So yeah, he's saying, yeah, we had a 20% win percentage. That does take a toll on you as a player. However, how much did they learn in those losses? You learn more when you lose. So uh, I'm pretty sure they're gonna be fine going into the finals. That's true. Now, with how Team Liquid is looking and how we see TSM is looking, and they're going to be meeting up in, that, in the finals in St. Louis. So the question is, how do you think this series will play out? Ooh, that's <laughs> a tough one. I think, um, I think TSM tries the same strategy that everyone else tries, uh, break it through the top lane, um, go through Viper, I mean, not Viper, go through uh, Broken Blade to mm -hmm. try and... Uh, work impact a little bit, but it really, to me, depends on which Acadian shows up because Smithy is such a smart jungler. Everyone always talks about how smart he is, great pathing, uh, deciding when to engage and when to disengage. And uh, Acadians seem to have lost that in the first couple games. And you can't afford to drop a couple games against this team with Double Lift, with Jensen, with world champion Core JJ. Uh, you just don't get that leeway here. So mm -hmm. I feel like it depends on Acadian if he's able to facilitate and then through the draft, make sure you're putting your best player on something to carry. So expect Bjergsen to have some big games. Ooh. All right. I want I want a hard answer, though. I want like, you know, the prediction, which team, <laughs> how many games, number. everything. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I, I love the fact that Acadian was able to bounce back. I love seeing the MVP at uh, high form, but I feel like money talks and this is the time for Jensen to win his first NALCS title now labeled LCS. So let's give it to Team Liquid 3-2. There it is. 3-2. I, I hope he goes that far. I hope it's a five game. I just want a good series. Yeah, right? I don't care who wins. Be close. Yeah. All right, Digon, thank you so much for breaking down the LCS with us. Enjoy the finals. Thank you, guys. You too. See ya. All right. Now that we've got the LCS covered, it's time to shift gears over to the LEC. Before we do, let's check out the highlights. Visitachi's not with the team. He's late to the party. Dragon secured by Brox and Fnatic. There's the flag, the drag, the dunk. Spies have once again boxed up the dragon. But there's no flash on Morskarin, as Jose is here. All right, Broxer's coming in as well. He's going to tunnel over the wall. Cobby goes forward. He's already got a kill, got a reset. Jumped on Broxer's head. There's Nexus is now being focused. Nemesis is stepping forward. That's a triple kill. Picked up for Cobby. The Quadra, the Nexus, and Splice even the series. Oh, Puepo's going to fence. See it, but at what cost? The Emperor's divide. And Puepo's going to get to... Oh! Where did that damage come from? I demand a replay. 
can splice do this again. Helisek dumps all the way forward. Fnatic just splits up, but it's already cost him. Brox has gone down. Reckless has gone just, down. Just Whoa, Brox Brox. Ladies and gentlemen, splice will not go quietly. Whippo and Brox. Oh, they're going. They're going for the Nexus. Kobe flashes back that defensively. Bumper's going to try to use that well then. That's going to bring it back up. The Nexus is being focused. That's a kill to Reckless. Fnatic have done it. What? the hell is that ending? All right, take a look at this. Teleport's coming out. Chachi's already down. Cersei used his ultimate, remember. Going to use that devastating charge of the Whippo. Whippo's going to go down. Now the tension turned around. Nemesis running for his life. He's tumbling. He stays alive. All of a sudden on the back end, Reckless is going to clean things up as Cobby is now left alone. Cobby is trying to run away. The event horizon is not working. Primordial Boost does not have enough damage. Splice put up a good fight. They improved and impressed, but it's Fnatic that will have the last laugh. It is Fnatic that has earned the right to defend their title in Rotterdam. Perks going in, the engage comes out, that's a lot of damage, really, Perks is taking down Mithy on the back line, Nuketsk getting chased away, but Patrick's still alive, and Yakos can't get onto him, two GAs popped in the middle of the fight, and it's a cluster of damage, as G2 just try and pick one player off at a time. Going the they're gonna do it! Yakos steals it away, and now G2 are just gonna force down Mithy, keeps Patrick in, the round, says the Nexus Tower's going down, G2, they fall the other way! G2 take the Nexus! And G2 have all the tools for the team fight! They take two, they take three, they take it sodding all! And they'll get the triple kill for Aurelia! The G2 are one game away from finals in Rotterdam! So we were wondering what they are going to do, they're just going to get engaged on! Charm lands onto Cold and second Charm onto Alfavi as well. Nuketa splitting down towards the bottom side, but Cold will pop the Cataclysm and he will fall. G2 just cleaning up Arjun, the Void Rush comes in, and Yanko sinks the fangs in! Chaos jumps in, Nuketa goes gold and pops the stop one for the moment, but he's down! and Caps and G2 will silence anyone that doubted them and they will fight for the title in Rotterdam. Three teams left in the fight for the LEC crown. So let's start with that series between Fnatic and Splice. Now for Fnatic, it wasn't the cleanest win. It was not. So what was it that they could have done better? I mean, there's a lot of things, but you look at the early game right away, and in the first three games, they fell behind against Splice, and that's already kind of a rough situation because early, early on the split, they were doing some good things with Broxa getting ahead and finding these early leads for Fnatic, but all of a sudden in the playoffs against Splice, they were just kind of sitting back and waiting till late game, and you saw, I mean, Fnatic does thrive in late game situations. I mean, Reckless is obviously a very good AD carry, and he's amazing in team fights but they just weren't being very uh, proactive and they were just relying on Splice's mistakes, which against better teams uh, is probably going to be a concern. So, I mean, they faced Vitality and Vitality was just, we, we saw, it was a very messy uh, series from them. And Splice was kind of along the same lines and they were giving uh, Fnatic opportunities mm -hmm. to take advantage of some of the things they were doing. So I think against better teams, they might run into some issues. So for Fnatic, they got to clean things up in the early game, try not to fall so far behind mm -hmm. and maybe get some different game plans going because it's all kind of just been like, Let's just play the late game and then let things take over from there. Do you think with the current meta, it's kind of like asking teams to wait for the late game? Or is that just like a preference for individual teams? I think there's different ways to play it. And it kind of all depends on what you want to run in the AD carry position. And I mean, some teams are running mages. Some mm -hmm. teams like Fnatic are going with these uh, scaling AD carries like Sivir, in which you just really want to sit back, push the lane in, and then just try to scale up and get some items. So I, I think it is pretty varying okay. in what you want to do. Um, but Fnatic, they just, they're just like, you know what? Sometimes we pick Karthus jungle. Sometimes we pick Sivir AD carry. And the best situation with those picks is obviously just to sit back. And I guess that's what they feel most comfortable with. Now, on Splice's end, what do you think they could have done perhaps to put up a better fight? I, I do want to call it Splice a little bit because okay. um, something they did I really didn't like. And I mean, you have Kabe on this team, right? He was voted as the, the first pro team, whatever the wording is for, for the LEC. Everyone thought he was the best AD carry this split. And yet they put him on mages twice. I mean, in game one, he was on Zoe. In game four, he was on Vagar, a champion that they didn't really even give him a good situation to be on because they picked it in the first pick ban phase. Right. And then Fnatic totally countered it afterwards. So he was kind of a sitting duck. Um, but you have this guy who in game two, they had an entire game plan to give him an early lead. And it worked out beautifully as he got 14 kills on Tristan. Ooh, that's the dream. Kills. Exactly. That's the dream. Um, so he's this guy. If you go to late game and he's on a scaling AD carry, he can give you a chance to win no matter what. Mm -hmm. He can he can go head to head with Reckless in those late game team fights, and instead they put him on these mages, which he was fine on. But let's be honest, he's not as good at mages as he is on AD carries. Just right. time played, right? Straight up. 
So for Splice, I mean, I don't fully agree with the game plan going into it. I think they tried to be a little too cute, where they should have just gone with what they know and what Kabe is, you know, you know he's going to perform on. So a little disappointed on that, and I think they just tried to be, you know, a little surprising for Fnet. Because of that, so. You know, if you see a team take that kind of strategy, doesn't that kind of show that they're probably like insecure and they kind of want to cheese their way to the win? They to didn't feel like they can actually match up, so they had to do a shortcut kind of thing. I think a lot of the idea in Splice's mind was, we know Fnatic late late game, yeah. so let's try something different. Let's try to get that early lead, which they did excel on in a couple of situations. Mm -hmm. But still, I think Splice's game plan, they like to play similar to Fnatic, where they kind of sit back, let Kabe scale, and go to late game situation. And I guess they didn't want to go in that Fnatic versus Splice, Reckless versus Kabe late game yeah. spot. They just wanted to try to counter it by going early, which ended up not working. You know what? Fair, fair game. You know, fair strategy, but it, you know, obviously, it didn't work out. Hindsight 2020. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the other series between G2 and Origin. G2 swept Origin. Spoiler. <laughs> yeah. In three games. So how was G2 able to take down Origin, who were actually looking very strong coming into the series? Yeah, they were. They had an incredibly strong end of the season and going into playoffs. A lot of uh, commentators, analysts, myself even thought that Origin had a chance to beat G2, mm -hmm. and I still think they they did okay. I mean, game one, they were in a situation where they could have won, but then G2 just kind of showed that um, they have playmakers across the board, right? Wonder is probably the best top laner, Yanko's the best jungler, Cap's the best mid laner, Mickey X the best support, uh, Perks is climbing the AD carry ladder even though it's only his first split playing full-time AD carry mm -hmm. in the LEC. Um, so I think when you have guys like that across every role that kind of outperform what Origin does on a on a one by one level, it's pretty Magic. tough, right? Yeah. So in that first game, I mean, Origin had a lead, but Caps was this guy making plays in the bot lane while G2 was taking Baron, and then Yankos was able to steal an Elder Dragon that kind of put everything over the top. And from there, once you lose a game like that, kind of tragically, it's tough to come back from. And Origin just didn't look the same in the next two games. Matt, I think the word you were looking for is styling on yeah, them. That's fair. Yeah, G2 were styling on them. All right, so now let's look from Origin's perspective. Right? They're going on to play against uh, Fnatic yes. in the next match to see who will meet G2 in the finals with the new LEC format. So how do you think this match is going to go? What can Origin do to maybe come back? So the thing that Fnatic, I, I mentioned before, right, is that yeah. they, they thrive on mistakes. Okay. That's what they do. Uh, for Origin, obviously it wasn't the cleanest series against G2. Maybe it was playoff nerves. You know, this team still hasn't had a ton of time together. It's still their first split. Um, but during the regular season, they're this calm and collected team that everyone was praising for just doing things systematically. Mm -hmm. And if they can get back to that playstyle, I can see them doing pretty well against Fnatic because they don't generally make those crazy risky plays, right? They just, they get a pick or something, they'll play it slow and then catch you off guard. Um, so if they go back to that playstyle, I think it could work against Fnatic because they generally sit back and let you do what you want, right? Right, right. Um, so again, I think they need to revert to their play stuff in the regular season. And if they do that, then they're in a good spot. But if they just let Fnatic play their game, go to late game and let Reckless take over, it's going to be rough, but I, it depends on what team adapts better to what they did in this, this round, right? Okay, okay. But now, okay, is there even a chance for either team to really take down G2 in the finals? Like, who stands a better chance, if any of them? I, I want to say that, that they do have a chance, but, I mean, you look at what they did uh, against Origin, and it was pretty dominant. And again, it goes yeah. back to just each position and how dominant they are, right? I mean... That's how they won during the regular season. They're just like, I'm going to beat you in lane and then translate that to the rest of the game. And even if they don't win the lane, they still have these guys who are just so good on a macro level, like Caps knows to split push to build pressure for his team so that they can then take objectives, even if they're behind on gold. It's just, it's absolutely brilliant in, in the way they play the game. And just having dominant laners gives you that edge no matter what. And I mean, if it's against a Fnatic, who likes to sit back and let G2 take that early lead, it's going to be ugly. And they just 3-0'd Origin. So, I mean, money's on G2. I think Fnatic might have a better chance than Origin. Yeah, which is um, the same. But yeah, it's, it's, it's looking rough. I mean, if you look at the history of Fnatic, you know, they've shown that in clutch moments, they can pick the right team fight yes. and they can turn a game. So I would put money, we're not betting here, we would no, put, put money not. on Fnatic. So we will see in the finals who comes out on top. All right, Matt, we have one last thing to take care of. Yes. It's the player of the week. So of all the players that have performed amazingly over this week, who is your choice for our player of the week? I think it has to be Bjergsen because you look at back at what Degon said, right? And he's that veteran presence on this team that you kind of fall back to when everything's on the line. And they drop the first two games and all of a sudden you put Bjergsen on a call, you put him on Zoe, you put him on the Zillion who he's kind of known for at this point. And he completely takes over some of these games. I mean, on that Akali, he was roaming, he was finding the carries with low HP bars and finishing them off. 
He was finding those picks on Zoe to just put out a ton of damage. And without him, without with a lesser uh, mid laner, I don't think they would have been able to pull off this reverse sweep. I know a lot of credit goes to Akkadian for pulling mm -hmm. things back. But at the end of the day, it has to go to your leader, right? The guy yeah. who's that, that backbone, that staple to your team, who's going to pull them back, be like, guys, look, we're down 0-2. We've been here before. It's no big deal. Just go out there, do everything you can, and let's, let's win it back. And he was the leader and the example for this TSM reverse sweep. So I think it has to go to Bjergsen. All right, the Beardson is our choice. Beardger King. Be Be Beardger King, is that his nickname? <laughs> Beardson. Be that's really complicated. All right, so he is our pick yes. for Player of the Week, and it's no doubt going to be an intense finals this weekend. So make sure you guys are catching all the games, the final games of the spring split. So big thanks to Degon for joining us today. And then tomorrow on Esports and 30, Ron Lee and AJ Fry will be here breaking down the opening week of Stage 2 of the Overwatch League. So until then, follow us on our socials at Squad State, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.